Whitney Houston had a squeaky clean image for the first half of her career, but in the later years of her life, her troubles became more apparent. While many of her demons have been well documented, the details that have come out since the late singer's passing paint an even darker picture. Here are some of the sad things we've learned about Whitney Houston after her death. Insiders claim Houston was a drug user long before she met Bobby Brown, and that her handlers and record label deliberately peddled the narrative that he corrupted the so-called good girl and got her involved in dangerous habits. The director of the 2017 documentary Whitney, Can I Be Me, called that a fairy tale, telling the New York Post, The idea that Whitney was a great girl until Bobby came along is simply not true. Whitney took drugs and smoked weed a long time before she could even spell Bobby Brown. Houston's longtime stylist Ellen LeVar says in the documentary, Whitney and her two brothers did drugs. It was the thing you do. You go out, you party, you drink, you do a little drugs. Everybody did it, and her brothers gave it to her. It was just something you do to have fun. Houston's older brother, Michael Houston, confessed to Oprah Winfrey that he introduced the singer to cocaine, not knowing the damage it could do. He admitted it's a demon he's forced to live with every day. In the entertainment industry, it was just like available. And it wasn't like a, a, a bad word like, like it is now. You know what I'm saying? We didn't know. Sources told people that Houston struggled with the pressures of fame and been forced into a role that didn't feel genuine. An insider close to the singer's family said, There were a lot of expectations in terms of who she was and who people thought she was. I think that not being able to be herself 100% was a hell of a burden for her to have to carry. Someone may look good on the outside, sturdy and strong, but on the inside you have someone who has insecurities and family issues and emotional personal issues and struggles. The insider added that once Houston signed with legendary producer Clive Davis, she had to do what he said, wear what he said to, sing whatever he wanted her to sing, and act like a goody two-shoes when she was really a down-and-dirty girl from Jersey. Whitney definitely resented that. A music industry source noted, Clive made her into a mainstream pop star and allowed all of her wildest dreams to come true. But being this massive pop star came at a price. She had to act a certain way in front of the cameras for the label. That wasn't the real Whitney. A family friend told People that Houston used drugs as a form of rebellion against her clean-cut image and the people who tried to control it, saying, Drugs became her rebellion against it all. There has to be some outlet. For her, it became drugs. A music industry insider concurred that Houston, quote, did drugs to escape her pain. Her drug use eventually transitioned from recreational dabbling to addiction. A family source told the magazine, Things got worse and worse. Suddenly when she was using, she had no idea who she was or who you were and became angry and lashed out. We'd take turns checking on her in Atlanta when things were bad. The insider claimed that enablers let Whitney do whatever she wanted to do for fear of getting fired. According to the 2016 book Whitney and Bobby Christina, The Deadly Price of Fame, Houston was targeted by a Chicago lawyer who tried to extort her back in 1992. On the eve of the Bodyguard film debut, the attorney alleged demanded $250,000 from the songbird or he'd go public with the intimate details about her love life. Whitney's father reportedly settled it immediately, though it wasn't confirmed how much money was paid. What kind of dirt was the lawyer threatening to dish? It could have been something to do with the rumors about Whitney being in a romantic relationship with her longtime assistant and close friend Robin Crawford. Whitney and her mother Sissy Houston both denied the claims, but even Bobby Brown alleged in his book Every Little Step that Whitney was attracted to men and women. In Whitney Can I Be Me, Whitney's former bodyguard David Roberts says, Bobby Brown and Robin Crawford were like fire and ice. They hated each other, they'd battle for her affections. He okay. wanted Whitney to remove Robin from their relationship and Whitney didn't want to do it. Ellen LeVar also says in the film, I think she was bisexual. Robin proved a safe place for her. One of Houston's former bodyguards, Kevin Ammons, claimed her father didn't approve of her alleged relationship with Robin Crawford. According to Whitney and Bobby Christina, The Deadly Price of Fame, John Houston offered Ammons $6,000 to, quote, put the fear of God in Robin. Ammons said he refused, and John then allegedly warned the bodyguards to keep a close watch on her. Whitney's mother, Sissy, told Oprah Winfrey she would absolutely be unhappy if Whitney had been in a relationship with a woman. It would have bothered you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you would not have liked that? Not at all. 
Sissy added that she didn't really like Robin, calling her sometimes disrespectful, but recognized that the two were very close friends. In 1999, Robin reportedly left the singer's inner circle for good. In Whitney Can I Be Me, LeVar called Robin's exit the beginning of Whitney's downfall. Brown also claimed that the family's scorn and Crawford's departure crushed Whitney, telling Us Weekly, I really feel that if Robin was accepted into Whitney's life, Whitney still would be alive today. She didn't have close friends with her anymore. Though in subsequent interviews, Brown has adamantly denied ever striking Houston, he admitted in his book that he did, at one time, hit her because she was allegedly doing drugs while he was trying to get clean. He wrote, I did strike Whitney. Me at the time trying to maintain a sobriety and the person that's in your relationship is not going along with it, it was rough. The former New Edition singer also accuses Whitney in his book of having more than one affair during their relationship, and he uses those allegations to justify his own infidelity. He explained, In fact, she cheated before I did. She slept with quite a few of the producers and artists that she worked with or associated with over the years. I won't drop any names here because they are still around, and a few view me as a friend. When I found out about the first one, I was blown away. I thought, okay, okay, you're gonna play me like that? I'm not that type of dude, but if you can do it, I can do it too. Houston and Brown were on relatively equal footing in their careers when they met in 1989 at the Soul Train Awards, but she eclipsed him in an epic manner with the success of 1992's The Bodyguard and its smash song, I Will Always Love You. Her longtime real-life bodyguard, David Roberts, believes Brown resented her for it, leading to the demise of their marriage. Roberts told The Guardian, Brown was just not good at looking after her. He was always either in conflict or creating conflict. He lost his own identity, which I suspect he resented deeply especially as his own talents were inferior to Miss Houston's. Roberts claimed Brown was physically and verbally abusive to Whitney. No matter how much he tried to placate his fragile ego, he added, Brown was jealous of her success, so he rubbed her face in his cheating. But she forgave him every possible indiscretion. I just couldn't understand it, and it ate away at her. Roberts said he believes Whitney would still be alive today if she hadn't gotten involved with Brown. He said of the My Prerogative singer, Unfortunately, Mr. Brown has a lot of inadequacies he has to come to terms with, and I'm not sure he has, even to this day. Brown previously confessed that Houston's struggle with drug abuse was severe, but sources claim in the documentary Whitney that it was even worse than previously reported. Houston's brother Michael, who worked as her tour manager, claimed they frequently used drugs together. In the film, LeVar and Roberts claim they were terrified for her life. LeVar says that she begged Houston to get clean for years. And Roberts said that he alerted Houston's team to her rampant drug use in 1999 after allegedly witnessing her overdose on her My Love Is Your Love tour. Instead of getting help for Houston, Roberts claims the team fired him. Houston reportedly tried to get help for her drug addiction but couldn't stay clean. Her former drug counselor claims in the film that the singer just wanted to be a normal, sober mother to find her daughter and didn't care about having expensive things. Despite Houston's well-documented drug abuse and autopsy results showing drugs in her system, Brown still insisted drugs were not to blame for her tragic death. He told Rolling Stone in February 2018 that she died from, quote, just being broken-hearted. Though the coroner's report cited cocaine, Benadryl, Xanax, and marijuana, Brown said she was really working hard on herself to try and be a sober person, and she was a great woman. Brown wouldn't elaborate on what he believed contributed to Houston's allegedly broken heart or why he refused to believe she was still using drugs at the time of her passing. Whitney director Kevin McDonald told Deadline, I think Bobby just isn't really ready to be honest. There's the perfect example of somebody who is, I think, feeling just very guilty. It feels like there's a lot of guilt and a kind of posturing and a self-protectiveness that's still going on there. And he felt, to me, just unwilling or unable to really be honest about himself, let alone to be honest about Whitney. In November 2019, Robin Crawford released her memoir, A Song For You, My Life With Whitney Houston, in which she detailed their relationship for the first time. Crawford wrote that they first met when they both worked as counselors at a summer camp when Crawford was 19 and Houston was about to turn 17. Crawford said their relationship was a physical and romantic one, but not for long. Houston ended their sexual relationship by gifting Crawford a Bible and explaining that being romantic would, quote, make their journey even more difficult. Crawford also said that Houston's mother disapproved 
disapproved of their relationship and said it was unnatural for women to be as close as Crawford and Whitney were. Crawford wrote, We never talked about labels like lesbian or gay. We just lived our lives and I hoped it could go on that way forever. The pair remained close until Whitney's tragic drowning death at 48 years old in 2012. Crawford says of their enduring bond, Whitney knows I loved her and I know she loved me. We really meant everything to each other. We vowed to stand by each other. Crawford alleged in her book that before Houston walked down the aisle with Brown, the How Will I Know singer was in hot pursuit of none other than Eddie Murphy. Murphy couldn't be tied down though, even for just one date. Crawford wrote, One day when Eddie was supposed to come for dinner, I caught a glimpse of Whitney. She was wearing a black dress and low-heeled slingbacks. For a moment, I thought, boy, I wish she was doing that for me. But Murphy didn't show up for the date, leaving Houston heartbroken. Crawford says Houston lost herself trying to land the Coming to America actor and comedian. It it wasn't until the day Houston was set to marry Brown that Murphy came around, with Crawford claiming Murphy called Houston to tell her she was making a mistake. She didn't listen. She said, Eddie, he must be out of his mind. Matter of fact, he is out of his mind. <laughs> Murphy had already had his chance, and by then she'd moved on and was head over heels for Brown. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, please call the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration's 24-7 National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357.